Adrian. Thank you. we see the other people? What's that? Will we see the other people? The attendees? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Yeah. It'll just be us. So right now I see Martin. Welcome, Martin. And Brian, welcome. We're going to take a minute and let folks come into the room. Ashley, I can see the list of attendees if you go to participants. Oh, the list, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can see the list. Their faces, no, unfortunately. Yeah. Welcome to our attendees. We're going to give just one more minute and then we will get started. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to our webinar, um, California Criminal Justice Funders Group webinar, Marijuana, Racial Equity and the Impact of New Laws on Black and Brown Communities. Um, my name is Adrian Sky Roberts and I'm the coordinator for CCJFG. Grateful to those of you all who are with us right at 11 and hoping more folks will join us. Um, just wanted to take a minute and appreciate your time and of course the panelists time as well. We know that it's continues to be a overwhelming and intense period of time with lots of layers of things, especially with the um, election fast approaching. So we know our attention is pulled in many different ways and are grateful to have your attention here for the next hour and a half on this subject. Um, just a couple things I know most of you know, but for 
for the sake of extra clarity, CCJFG is a funder affinity group um, working with California funders who are investing in and supporting our movements to end prisons, policing, and criminalization. And this subject on marijuana, racial equity, and the new laws has been something that's been sort of on the horizon for us to turn our attention to as CCJFG for a while. I know that I'm learning, have learned so much just from the conversations I've had prepping for this with our panelists, and I'm really grateful to extend that all to you um, who are on the line now and who will watch the recording of this video later. Um, we have uh, a great panel of folks who've been working and organizing together on this issue for quite a while, um, as well as Christine Tien from the California Endowment who has helped to put this together on the back end. So appreciation to all of you. Um, I'm gonna also put just one more quick announcement before we sort of move on into our content. Um, CCJFG has an upcoming membership meeting. It's a new, a new sort of thing we've been trying out this year and our final membership meeting for 2020 is on November 20th. I'll put a link in the chat. Um, but the subject of that membership meeting is gonna be about funding security for activists in the post-election climate. Um, so we'll hear from the Urgent Action Fund in that meeting about doing exactly that, funding activists, frontline organizers, given um, the continued hostile climate that we know will happen after the election, no matter what the, the results are. So would love your participation there on November 20th. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will just launch into our content. All right. Can I get a thumbs up from my panelists if you can see that? Cool, great. So um, let me share with you what our agenda will be before we pass, before I pass the baton off to Malachi. Um, we're gonna start off with a um, trailer that Malachi will introduce in a minute. And then we'll go to um, Dr. Flo Kofer from Public Health Advocates overviewing the racialized history of marijuana who will then pass it back to Malachi Seku Amen of California Urban Partnership for an analysis of the economic impact on the war on drugs and the campaign for economic equity. And then we will hear from Sarah Michael Gaston and Jim Keddy from Youth Forward on the cannabis tax revenues and community investment. And we will um, end with Christine Tian of the California Endowment on the role of philanthropy in this issue. Um, the California Endowment specifically, but how others can join TCE in supporting this, this issue and this conversation. And then we're going to open it up for Q&A. And because we have a small group today, we're going to ask you all to raise your hands and then I will just go ahead and unmute you um, and we'll hear your voices and engage in a, a dialogue that way. So as always, please uh, input your comments and questions in the Q&A function and also the chat. Um, and I will pass it off to Malachi to introduce us um, to the trailer. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Adrian and the California Criminal Justice Funders, along with the California Endowment for uh, inviting us to talk to you today about uh, uh, this uh, uh, volatile, uh, uh, but also very interesting uh, uh, subject matter of uh, of racial and health equity and marijuana policy. Um, the California Urban Partnership recently released a preview of When the Smoke Clears. It's an upcoming mini documentary film series that will tell eye-opening stories about history, money, politics, and pain uh, uh, surrounding weed. Uh, this project is produced in collaboration with uh, uh, our partners, uh, public health advocates uh, who led the study um, and uh, uh, did it with UC Davis uh, Center for Regional Change, uh, the Million Dollar Hoods Project, as well as UCLA. And they produced a study that maps marijuana-related arrests in the state. 
the project has the same name as the study and highlights findings of the report. We will also plan to enhance this series by highlighting findings of a second report on cannabis tax revenue, uh, which was released by our partners at Youth Forward, along with, public, with the Public Health Institute. And by humanizing the data with testimonies of real drug war victims, uh, we hope to compel a broad cross-section of policymakers, opinion leaders, key stakeholders in the public to become engaged in addressing a framework for racial and health equity uh, at the local and state levels in the state. So without further ado, I present to you the series preview for When the Smoke Clears. Adrian, you might have to, if not, we can't hear the sound. So if you pause it and then um, when you share your screen, you might have to put um, share audio. So like maybe unshare. And then when you press the share, um, there'll be a little box at the bottom. Um, share. Yeah, that says share audio. Yep. This is not the first time Sarah Michael has helped me with tech. <laughs> she is the champ. <laughs> All right, let's try this again, everyone. Thank you. The legal cannabis industry could be $200 billion a year. Are we going to look back at this time and think, that was the time where the money could be made, the golden era of cannabis investing? Yes, I truly believe that. The best macroeconomic opportunity I've seen within the US markets in my career. Uh, mother-in-law, she was shot. Uh, a whole house was shot up because of marijuana. And she was 81 years old. My oldest son, uh, he was beaten by the police because of some marijuana. They did what they said, but and still the other cop came from the other side and he like hit him from the back with the billy club and he fell down and hurt himself. But they still took him to jail. They keep me upset all the time, worried. When he left home, I was thinking I was well, this might be his last time, he might not come back. And right now on the left leg, they messed up his kneecap and he had a limp when he walked. And the police did that to him. Well, my mother who's never broken the law before uh, in her life was held at gunpoint. And this was attributable to the actual war on drugs. Um, and as a child growing up with that reality, just not explain to you what's going on and you're uh, left to internalize this and deeply affected by it, deeply, deeply affected by it. Earl Sampson has been stopped and questioned by police a total of 258 times. There's nothing on his criminal record other than a, a marijuana possession charge. He was shot last night and he didn't survive. I got caught with some weed, let me do two years off of that. And I see him now selling weed. It was an industry and I know they are making billions off of it now. We still down here going to jail over nickel bags or whatever. The impact of the criminal justice system doesn't impact one person. It begins to erode that family structure, and that's what makes strong neighborhoods. We didn't get no alcohol money. We didn't get no cotton money, no tobacco money, no rice money. Matter of fact, we weren't even reparated. impacts drug epidemic that data is looking at. And so for us, looking at the tax revenue and reinvestment have to take into account the experience of, that residents are left behind, that our communities are not going to see the benefits of the legalization, especially when we look at tax revenue. If we were to see the benefits, it would mean that the city would really think about an equitable distribution 
an investment of tax reinvestment dollars. We need our own Truth and Reconciliation Commission here both in the state of California, but then also nationally, right? We need to reconcile these issues because one of the reasons why we're having a hard time is because people don't understand how history has affected yeah, and how history has affected the inequities we, we deal with today. to repair some of um, our done because of the war on drugs. And, and, and I, I would say I think it's a mixture of, of, of policy. Like there's all these ways in which folks are talking the system disproportionately poor folks is pretty like when we talk about any system, um, when we talk about money credit and creating equitable opportunities, um, equitable legislation around it, um, creating systems that su can support them in that process. Um, and protecting them. More needs to be done to direct tax revenue into leveling the playing field. It's and gonna help the government or be part of the justice system. Don't fail us. Don't fail us. Okay, and so now uh, we'll hear next from Dr. Flo Kofer with Public Health Advocates. And um, I, I, I think Zoom probably is not a um, good platform for, for videos because the sound was uh, going in and out, but I think everyone does have the uh, link uh, to go back and, and watch it with all the full sound effects and, and uninterrupted. Dr. Yes. Kofer. Thank you, Malachi. It's a real pleasure to be here and I really appreciate everyone who's on this webinar this morning. I am Flo Kofer. I am the Senior Director of Policy with Public Health Advocates and I'm really excited this morning to be able to walk you through part of the background and the context for why we have done this work and then also highlight the first of the two reports that you're gonna hear about today. So Adrian, if you have slides, we'll be all set to go. I think Adrienne was saying that she couldn't share the screen. Oh, the okay. Chats. I don't know why. Maybe, maybe it's working now. If not, I can share mine. If you just. Perfect. Okay, so um, I, I always like to start with this slide because, you know, the reefer madness um, that started in the 30s and really continued on, it's important for us to have some historical context. And so part of the reason why the war on drugs has been so challenging is because it operates at the intersection of um, a person's individual racist beliefs and how they're then codified into institutional power. And so when we think about the, we often call it the war on drugs, but I often think that there are at least like five words that are missing from that statement because this is really a, a war on people who used or possessed drugs. Um, and that war certainly had um, a racialized undertone. And so this is um, the, this quote that is in front of you um, is probably pretty startling to most people. It's from Harry Engsler, and he was the, the first commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narco Narcotics, which um, then became um, the Drug Enforcement Agency. And he had really um, particular beliefs about, you know, who used drugs and what it caused. Um, and his beliefs at the time were that, you know, marijuana was um, used primarily by um, people of color and entertainers, um, in particular Black people, um, Latinos, and um, Pacific Islanders, Filipinos in particular and that the music in particular um, resulted from marijuana usage. And it also created something that at the time was illegal, which was um, miscegenation or, or you know, having um, intimate relationships with people of a different race in particular, um, if you were not a, a white person,
person and you were having um, sexual relationships in particular with white women. Um, and he's also quoted as having said, Reefer makes darkies think they're as good as white men. And so if you think about the, the politics of the time and really where Anglinger is um, operating, it's you know obviously post-Civil War, um, post-World uh, War I. And when we're in this sort of in-between time where we're really reconciling with what does it mean um, as a country to live in this space? What are the policies that were coming about? And uh, I, I think those policies are incredibly important in terms of sort of codifying a lot of what was happening with, um, with Jim Crow laws and expanding them beyond um, what we often think of as the boundaries of that. Next slide, please. So I bring up Harry Anslinger because the idea of this war on drugs is that we have not always had these beliefs, in particular when it came to marijuana and other similar substances. Um, and so this timeline that we're going to walk through, I think, is important because it, it just um, puts into context how much we went back and forth about where we felt and, and how these things sort of built on themselves. So in 1930, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, again, the precursor of the DEA, was established, and Harry Anslinger was the head of that. Um, and about 14 years later, the New York Academy of Medicine released a report that essentially said that marijuana did not use, do the things that he had been claiming for many years. It didn't cause violence. It didn't provoke, um, you know, your mental illness. It, it did not lead to, to addiction or promote opiate use. Um, and this was dismissed by Engslinger in his department. Um, and, you know, about uh, eight years later or so, the first of these significantly um, criminalized uh, uh, policies were passed known as the Boggs Act. And that basically set mandatory minimums of two to 10 years for possession of marijuana. Um, and as we know is often the case when something is passed at the federal level, states also would then add on their own um, additional penalties in a similar fashion. And so that happened over the ensuing 10 years where, where what were known as Little Boggs Acts were enacted by the states. Um, and about four years after the Boggs Act was passed, the Daniel Act was passed, and it basically increased those penalties by eight times. So depending on you know, what you were charged with, you could be charged with up to 80 years um, you know, in prison for um, possession of marijuana. And so this was happening, you know, in, in during the 1950s and early 60s. And if we then fast forward to 1970, the Controlled Substances Act um, is passed. And a year later, President Nixon declares the war on drugs, um, and, and he calls it public enemy number one. Next slide. Which is interesting. Oh, uh, which is interesting because a year later, the Schaefer Commission report um, basically advocate, advocated for decriminalizing marijuana for personal use. And again, for political reasons, President Nixon rejected this. Um, five years later, the, the Drug Enforcement um, Agency, now no longer under Harry Anslinger, who left after 32 years over the, the office, um, acknowledged that decriminalization was worth considering um, it, during the Carter administration, but that never really took hold. And by 1981, we now had President Reagan, and um, the DEA then switched its position um, and called, you know, marijuana the most urgent drug problem facing the United States. And so, as it follows, during um, that during that time that um, President Reagan was in um, in office, we see the Comprehensive Crime Control Act, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, and the Anti-Drug Abuse Amendment, which basically codifies what we commonly know um, in, in sort of the current generations as the war on drugs. Um, and those really significantly raised the federal penalties for marijuana possession, cultivation, and trafficking. And the sentences were largely tied to how much of the substance you had. Next slide. So I bring this up because we talked about, you know, institutional power and the intersection of racism. And I think it's really important that we also just have a conversation about redlining as well, because it's another example of institutional racism. Um, it was the official practice from 1934 to 1968, um, wherein the Federal Housing Authority graded neighborhoods and graded them from A, which was the best, to D, which was hazardous. Um, and D communities were communities where Black people were allowed to live. Um, sometimes they were also the communities where Indigenous people were allowed to live. And I frequently frequently remind people that the original, you know, build the wall movement was actually related to, uh, was re related to redlining because if a new community was being built that was an A or B community and it was in close proximity to a redlined community, the recommendation was to make sure that it was separated by some sort of impenetrable boundary, which was either a freeway or railroad tracks, which is why we have the common, um, you know, refrain of the other side of the railroad tracks, or if that was not possible to build a wall. Um, 
and so the goal here really was residential segregation, um, that we wanted our white communities, those A-rated communities, um, to have investment, to have lower mortgage rates. Um, it, it was a place where businesses were encouraged to build and really where hope was encouraged to thrive. And those D-rated communities were places where mortgages were not encouraged um, to be backed, or they were set at really high rates, um, and where you know institutional support and generally investment in communities was incredibly lacking. Next slide, please. And so the reason that I bring up redlining in this context, and one more click, please, Adrian, um, is because you know, we're thinking about this entire war on drugs. And one of the things we know is that has a racial component to it. And part of the reason that this was possible is because it overlaps significantly with redlining. So during the time that Harry Anslinger and others were, were in um, office and they were passing these um, policies, they already had in their minds the idea of who used drugs and who they were attempting to criminalize by passing these policies. And so then when you, when you segregate people into communities um, based on their racial and ethnic um, designations, then you're able able to, to criminalize in those communities. And so in D-rated communities, there was a higher police presence um, and there, you were much more likely to be searched for drugs and we were seeking out drugs. And so it does not surprise anyone who sort of sees this and sees the overlap and sees the underlying you know, uh, assumptions that went into some of these policies, why then um, the, the racial disparity is so pronounced when it comes to who was arrested and who was impacted by the war on drugs. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the impact of the war on drugs in California. The impact was community trauma. We incarcerated people, we separated families. Um, and for those who were convicted of felonies, it significantly jeopardized their immigration status, um, their child custody, their employment, their housing and social service access. Um, and what we know is that marijuana prosecution was largely concentrated in black and Latino communities. And what we, we also know is that the distinctions in who was arrested are entirely attributable to racial bias in law enforcement, because one of the things that we know, and I will probably say this at least one more time during my time with you, is that people uh, across racial and ethnic groups tend to use drugs and in particular marijuana at about the same rates. But what is different is how they're criminalized for that use, whether or not we even seek out uh, marijuana uh, for as, as an offense that we're looking for and, what, and also whether or not we prosecute it. Next slide. So this brings us to the first of the reports that you're going to hear about under the banner of when the smoke clears. Um, and this is looking at the racial disparities in California's um, marijuana arrests. And th this work was done by UC Davis Center for Regional Change, as well as the Million Dollar Hoods program at UCLA, public health advocates, um, and, and um, was sponsored by the California Endowment. Next slide. And so what we found as we did this study, and we looked at um, marijuana arrests from 1996 until 2016, which was when Proposition 64, the Adult Use of Marijuana Act was passed. And what we saw across this time is that again, across racial and ethnic groups, people use marijuana at about the same rates. And yet statewide, black people were four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana related um, offenses than whites. Um, and so you can see this really in, in black and white here um, as we're looking at the, the chart on the right, which is so the trends in arrests with a peak happening sometime around 2008 and then a sharp decline thereafter. But even at our best, um, you know, the, the highest rate, we were seven times higher at our best, it was still about a four times higher rate of arrest um, as compared to, to white Californians. Next slide. And then when we look at the local disparities, part of this research looked at um, each county in, in um, the state of California, as well as some cities. And what we found is that Black Sacramento residents were arrested on marijuana related charges 29 times more often than white residents, which is seven times the state average. Unfortunately, Sacramento has the distinction of being the highest rate in the entire state. Um, and, but other notably high um, cities include Palo Alto, um, Southgate, Oakland, Berkeley, Fremont, South San Francisco, and Citrus Heights, all of which are in Northern California. It's interesting how the, the regional um, collection on that uh, applies. And so uh, what you're seeing on your right are just some, some snapshots of the, the report and some of the data that are provided for each of the jurisdictions that are covered. Next slide, please. 
So I brought this up because if we think about the legacy of redlining, right, 50 years later, we're still seeing the impact of that. Two thirds of those um, redline neighborhoods are inhabited primarily by Black and Latinos, um, and three quarters of them continue to struggle economically. And when we compare that to the green line communities, those communities that were racially segregated during that time um, to, to um, primarily benefit um, white people, and of course that definition of who was white changed over time because when it first started in 1934, it didn't include people who were Jewish or Catholic Catholic or Irish, and that changed pretty quickly over the first 10 years um, when that policy was passed. But 91% of those green line areas remain middle to upper income to this day, and 85% are still predominantly white. And a lot of people will ask, well, how, how is that possible? We, got, we did away with this policy 50 years ago. But the challenge is that only about 2% of homes are sold every year, and homes are something, you know, as, as a big asset that are often passed down from generation to generation. And so it's really important that um, we recognize the role that that has played and the ongoing way that the war on drugs was able to um, present itself in the future. Next slide. And so then when we begin to think about the geographic disparities, um, we recognize that, you know, looking again at Sacramento County, and we have these data for, for um, several of the counties um, throughout the state of California, that if we look at just the top five census tracts where people were booked for marijuana arrests um, at a much higher rate, what we see is that they also have median household incomes that are ranging from about $12,000 per year to about $36,000 per year, which is less than 60% of the state median income. So what we're seeing is, again, that impact of the redlining of the, you know, initial um, marijuana related arrests, how they then compound onto later drug policies, and how all of this creates a really significant racial um, and ethnic disparities when it comes to who was arrested and who was most impacted by the war on drugs. And this leads us to today where we are now four years into the legalization um, of the adult use of marijuana. And we really need to be thinking about what do we do to be able to right these historic wrongs and to be able to repair communities that were largely harmed by this. And so with that, I am going to pass this along to my colleague, Malachi Sekulamen, the Executive Director of the California Urban Partnership. Thank you, Flo. Thank you so much. That's a, a brilliant framing of the public health impacts around criminalization and really uh, is a segue to the legacy that uh, economic impacts uh, have and continue to have and, and uh, how they are very much racialized. Uh, although cannabis has become normalized throughout the country and dominated largely by wealthy white investors and an important uh, tax revenue source, uh, it is important to avoid simply um, simplifying what the solution should now be. And I say this because all too often advocates see policymakers and some of the other influencers in this new environment, um, uh, we see them embrace what is familiar and what is easy. Um, let's go to the next slide uh, because we really wanna kind of meditate on the uh, image a, a little bit. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, we don't uh, uh, look at is, is the legacy of the war on drugs here. And, um, you know, because uh, in, in this field of having to, um, in this field of, of, uh, of, of advancing racial and health equity, what we have is a, a challenge to uh, make sure that decision makers don't hide behind the stigmas as an excuse to supporting full harm reduction and meaningful repair of drug war damages. For example, one of our key observations uh, in the work over the last three years has been the, uh, the great attention that has been paid, absolutely important attention paid to trauma-informed uh, youth drug prevention, criminal records expungement, and job placement aspects of doing racial equity work in the marijuana policy space. At the same time, however, inadequate attention and investment has been placed upon the entrepreneurial genius and ecosystem needs and drug war ravaged communities. Along with this uh, lack of attention, lack of resources and data, we see a new multi-billion dollar cannabis industry engaging in one of the most massive uh, wealth transfer activities since slavery really. Uh, with this happening, two 
of many different central policy and community organizing questions emerge. One question is, can equity advocates do their best work if they lack focus, capacity, and collaboration around all four edges of marijuana policy? And that includes public health, economic development, tax revenue, and criminal justice system reform. The second question is, can justice in the cannabis equity space actually happen if there's a failure to forge business, economic development, and wealth creation power into the public policy outcomes that we're looking for? After all, economists broadly agree that business and real property ownership are two most important channels for wealth creation in America. And so when we dissect the racialized economic impacts in this space, we see a very stubborn pattern of handcuffs going on. Uh, and that's why we have this, this image here. Uh, but one of the things that we see is that these handcuffs never get completely uh, removed uh, over time because the economic keys are always missing. Over many decades of weed criminalization, handcuffs were not just placed on tens of millions of Black and Indigenous people of color for nonviolent marijuana offenses. The handcuffs literally arrested their family, homes, money, and the economic futures of children over many generations. Our position at the California Urban Partnership, you know, which you know, which is um, very much focused on economic security. Our position is that if a case is not intentionally and successfully made for building community wealth for Black and Indigenous people of color, those handcuffs will stay on. Next slide, please. And so we see uh, data uh, released in 2016 uh, uh, from the Corporation for Economic Development and Institute for Policy Studies, which shows that without an intentional effort to correct the impacts of the war on marijuana and other related policies, it will take 228 years for Black families to accumulate the same amount of wealth as whites. For Latino families, it will take 84 years. Next slide. So let's just kind of talk about, you know, what uh, we've been doing um, uh, to uh, address uh, some of these findings um, that have been discussed so far. For the past three years, the California Urban Partnership, Youth Forward, and public health advocates have collaborated to advance racial and health equity in marijuana policy. At the local and state level, we have leveraged our collective networks and expertise in research, policy analysis, and grassroots organizing to shape community economic and youth development outcomes in order to effectively address public health impacts of the war on weed. Our wide range of successes includes bringing together over 400 influencers and advocates in LA, San Diego, Fresno, Sacramento, and Oakland to raise awareness, as well as help shape the direction of 50 million in state cannabis tax revenue for grant program serving systems impacted population. At the local level, our coalition building policy design and negotiation work led to the adoption of Sacramento's Cannabis Opportunity Reinvestment and Equity Program, which is also known as CORE. And so this is, CORE is a business technical assistance, license fee waiver, uh, funding and equity program uh, in the city of Sacramento. And it's now a model that has influenced uh, its own replication throughout California and a few localities and states with emerging cannabis equity policies, uh, such as Illinois, Georgia, and New York. On the note of research, a statewide survey on voter perspectives, along with uh, groundbreaking studies um, uh, that you heard about from, from Flo on marijuana-related arrests, and, and uh, Jim and Sarah will come and talk later about uh, the cannabis tax revenues. You know, those studies have been completed and uh, we will combine them in our uh, continued narrative and systems change work with an eye on real justice, equity, and reinvestment. Next slide, please. Just a little bit more context about the journey to equity um, at the local and state government level. Uh, in Sacramento, uh, unlike cities 
such as Oakland, San Francisco, LA, and now San Diego, uh, the journey to equity in, in Sacramento, uh, for example, was not jump-started by elected officials. All of the equity on this issue um, uh, uh, was simply not a priority to elected officials in Sacramento. And so we led community education and organizing, which mobilized a variety of networks that included the local uh, uh, endowment network for building healthy communities, the anti-recidivism coalition, the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, My Brother's Keeper, the Urban League, NAACP, and many others. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> One of our experiences was around uh, requesting that a social equity analysis uh, be done. And we had uh, so many back and forths with the city. They said this was not uh, uh, required. Uh, and, and when they said it was not required, it was uh, probably three months after the city council had uh, uh, passed the measure uh, and we uh, ultimately found out, uh, as we knew, that a social equity analysis would be required uh, to uh, lay the legal foundation for, for, for doing something intentional of, around uh, racial disparities. And so what we uh, uh, ended up doing was, uh, you know, working uh, with the city to make sure that we were paying attention to who was arrested and also engaging the community uh, in uh, uh, what the impacts were, articulating those, and then also shaping what the solutions uh, uh, should be. And uh, we struggled to get uh, that kind of outcome, but ultimately we, we got it in um, um, the adoption of the core program. And we're able to get some significant restorative and economic justice, even though there's so much more work to be done. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, part of the work uh, in Sacramento, as well as the state capital, was was developing an equity framework. Um, you know, looking at who was uh, qualified, such as you know a person who's arrested, a person who. Uh, lived in a certain zip code or census tract area uh, uh, and in a low income family for at least five years uh, in that zip code and census tract area that had been uh, determined to be uh, disproportionately uh, targeted for marijuana related arrests. And then the third qualification being someone related to a person who got arrested or someone related to a person who uh, is from a low income family household to ensure that uh, uh, opportunities in the cannabis uh, industry are afforded to those uh, who were most impacted. Next slide. Uh, we also mapped out uh, technical assistance and, and, and business assistance. Uh, we faced many delays, but our consistent uh, coalition building uh, led to um, uh, a city investment of $2 million for technical assistance programs for uh, cannabis uh, equity uh, participants to receive business planning as well as legal uh, support, which is absolutely essential in this very costly and complex regulatory environment. In California, and there was a number of other um, uh, benefits that we were able to negotiate, such as requiring, for example, dispensaries to place on their shelves the products of cannabis uh, 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 equity uh, operators. Uh, next slide. Um, again, there were uh, many delays, and um, you know, at times. You know, we really thought that it's so important uh, that you know we communicate uh, and 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 articulate uh, these delays uh, to some uh, of the other activists around the state, so um, that that they would be able to to kind of uh, forecast or or get a, a flavor for for some of the. Um, 
the tactics that have been used uh, uh, to, to delay uh, equity and to subvert uh, equity. Uh, next slide. Um, we had consistent uh, community engagement and um, um, part of that consistent community engagement uh, in Sacramento, um, I should say, not only led to the adoption of the cannabis equity program in Sacramento, but it also um, supported our efforts to get passage of SB 1294, which is the California Cannabis Equity Act, uh, which over the past two years has dispersed $40 million for access to capital uh, to um, social equity operators uh, in the state. The money is directed to cities and counties uh, who then create loan programs or grant programs and, and get those uh, get those dollars out. Next slide. I think it's important uh, to, to, to look at what we're up against, <coughs> excuse me, as we are advocating for equity. We're dealing with really uh, another uh, big industry. You know, you hear all the time, big, big tobacco, big alcohol, uh, we now have big marijuana, uh, and it's growing quickly into a powerful corporatized industry. Next slide. The total economic output of legal weed is expected to grow uh, uh, from our last count at 16 billion in 2017 to 40 billion by 2021. That's 150% increase. Next slide. The industry is hiring top lobbying firms and is making political contributions to both uh, political parties. And um, uh, what uh, we've seen uh, in Sacramento is that uh, there are some connections to even um, campaign contributions using money coming from the the, from the Ukraine uh, and tied into the conflict of the Rudy uh, Giuliani and um, uh, Trump administration's scandal around funneling uh, illegal foreign campaign contributions into uh, political campaigns uh, in exchange for favors. Um, all of that, <laughs> believe it or not, actually reached little old Sacramento and the FBI is now investigating as we still uh, uh, struggle to get parity and equity uh, in the industry. Next slide. So, um, you know, when we, when we look at the uh, expansion of, of this industry, um, over two decades, we've, you know, we've moved uh, from reefer madness to accepting and promoting the medical benefits of weed. Uh, marijuana has become normalized, uh, particularly among young people. And recreational marijuana is legal in uh, the District of Columbia and uh, 11 states. Medical marijuana is legal in 32 states. In 2019, uh, Illinois became the 11th U.S. state to legalize adult use marijuana. Utah and Missouri, meanwhile, approved statewide medical marijuana measures. And now we have approximately 67% of the U.S. population living in a state with some form of legal marijuana. We'll talk a little bit later about why it's important to continue the economic equity uh, campaigns that we've been doing on the ground and others uh, around the state and around the nation. Next slide. What we're seeing in the this new legalization environment is a transfer of wealth. There's the underground economy, uh, which uh, for decades has been made volatile by a racialized enforcement uh, practice uh, and has come with the risk 
and the cost of mass incarceration. And the money is going into a legal economy that's, uh, uh, um, uh, that has a regulatory structure designed uh, uh, to benefit wealthy white entrepreneurs and investors. And, and that regulatory structure is very complex. Uh, it's very costly um, to get into the industry um, at any level um, of, of seriousness, you're looking at probably around 1.5 uh, million uh, at this point as the regulations have evolved. Next slide. So the work that um, you know we have in front of us, um, you know, uh, reflects the sea change that we're that we're in with the emergence of of, uh, of uh, recreational and legal marijuana. And while legalization uh, re represents progress in some respects, there is much work to do to support racial justice and human rights. Um, and the work ahead concerns policy areas and business and economic development, what happens to the tax revenue, uh, the public health, the criminal justice system reform, and we see that uh, all of those are tied to how we build economic security and close uh, the racial wealth gaps. Uh, we really have the opportunity to shift the paradigm away from punishment, uh, stigma, and racial bias towards prevention, harm reduction, equity, and economic justice. Next slide. So what is the status of California's uh, equity programs? The status is that uh, you know they're under constant attacks and threats of a virus while treating their underlying uh, conditions. And so let's talk about uh, the the um, the examples of what's working uh, and what's uh, not working. Um, you know, we we helped shape the creation of of the state cannabis. Uh, uh, business equity grants. Uh, but one of the problems, uh, despite that progress, is there's no equity criteria associated with getting uh, a state license. Uh, so you could get a license in one of five cities that actually have an equity program and have, have decided to pay attention to the impacts of racialized enforcement. But there are all of these other cities and counties that don't do that. Uh, and so you could get a license at a required license at the local level uh, in a city that does not require any kind of obligations to people who've been uh, harmed by the war on drugs, uh, and then turn around and go and get that uh, uh, second layer of licenses at the state level uh, and not be required to do anything in order to get your license uh, from the state. So that's a problem. Um, we were successful in working uh, with our partners um, on the Community Reinvestment Grants Program. And, and one area in particular, um, you know, we noticed that Prop 64 not only did not provide a prescription for how cities and counties should shape equity and the implementation of Prop 64, but the Community Reinvestments Grants Program at uh, the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development did not allow um, uh, uh, people impacted to actually get a grant to focus on business and economic development. And so, um, um, you know, we're happy about that. 40 million has uh, uh, gone out um, uh, in, in part to, you know, to correct some of the earlier problems that 40 million um, in addition to the community reinvestments grants program uh, is for cannabis um, access to capital uh, for cannabis businesses, but the funding is not flexible for strategically addressing licensing issues, um, uh, dispensaries, um, you know, it doesn't allow just uh, uh, folks to have seed capital for projects that incubate uh, black and brown entrepreneurs social enterprise models like homeboy industries 
uh, and Delancey Street. You know, none of those kinds of things are, are getting funding and it's causing problems and for another problem with further delay. In the 2020-21 state budget, uh, we saw 59 million uh, passed for state and local government law enforcement, uh, but only 15 million uh, for the state equity access to capital program that's managed by the governor's office of business and economic development. You know, and really we're concerned about that because uh, at the end of the day, what it leads to is uh, the state using police uh, as mercenaries to protect the interests and get rid of their competition. Uh, and so, you know, we have a, um, we, we have a need to be intentional about how uh, to correct uh, uh, the imbalance and how those dollars are are being spent. Uh, we see lawsuits against the city of Los Angeles for allowing foul play in their dispensary application process, um, favoring those who had faster internet speed uh, and were able to get um, their applications in uh, uh, sooner and as well as faster because they had uh, some advantages. Uh, next slide. So going forward, uh, in terms of, uh, of, of uh, the work, you know, we really see a need uh, in continuing to, to develop peer learning networks um, uh, across the state and, and around the nation, uh, especially as we see uh, new states uh, emerging and that there um, are opportunities to influence uh, how those laws and regulations uh, are shaped uh, very early. Uh, we need data uh, and, a, and a landscape analysis. Some of the data uh, includes, um, you know, how licenses are being issued so that we're able to measure the extent to which those licenses, the percentage of licenses are actually going to people who've been impacted by the war on drugs. We also need to do a comparative analysis of of uh, uh, cities as well as uh, states around how the look and feel uh, of their programs are uh, rolling out. Um, so I'll just stop there and um, thank you so much uh, for your time and attention. I'd now like to hand it over to uh, my colleagues at Youth Forward, Jim Ketty and Sarah Michael Gaston. Thank you so much Malachi uh, for that analysis of the um, cannabis uh, revenues and just the uh, industry and why it needs to go back to our communities. So you're probably wondering, how can cannabis tax revenues serve to support youth and families in the black and brown communities most impacted by the war on drugs? How can these new revenues uh, streams support the health and well-being of people who have been incarcerated? And how can these funding streams strengthen the racial justice field in California over the long term. Let me tell you how. Uh, next slide. So in the first year uh, post legalization, state agencies issued 50 million in grants to nonprofits, health departments, and tribal communities working in communities most impacted by the war on drugs. This year, agencies will issue an additional 70 million. The state projects from cannabis revenue will continue to grow over time as more local governments allow for legal businesses. And as Malachi was saying, Youth Forward, Public Health Advocates, the California Urban Partnership, and several uh, CBOs and policy orgs have been uh, leading voices in racial equity and community re reinvestment when it comes to cannabis legalization in California. These state marijuana funds didn't have to be allocated towards social services and healing the disproportionate impact of the war on drugs, but we've made sure that, you know, we've made it our mission to get these funds um, for black and brown communities by, you know, as Malachi was saying, um, through policy, uh, meeting with the administrators of, um, of all of the grant programs and uplifting uh, voices on the ground uh, that have been directly impacted in those meetings to tell um, the funders what is needed um, and, um, and making sure that the grant programs, you know, work for small nonprofits that they um, provide monies, um, you know, upfront, uh, so they don't have to, you know, 
you know, be reimbursed for it and um, that they provide technical assistance and um, stuff like that. So we've been really instrumental um, in shaping these cannabis tax revenues uh, to go back towards uh, our community. Next slide. So what are uh, the grant um, programs? You know, there, there are these opportunities um, for nonprofits and uh, these are the four, <clears throat> Um, you know, biggest ones that we have been uh, following. And so the first one is the Community Reinvestment Grants Program managed by the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, uh, GoBiz for short. And uh, this one is for nonprofits and local health departments that work to reverse the harm caused by past drug policies. And it supports organizations that provide services like job placement, mental health treatment, and reentry services for those, have been, those who have been formerly incarcerated or who have been impacted by those um, incarcerated due to cannabis convictions. And the thing to note about this particular GoBiz uh, money is that it supports families, adults, and kids. The second one is the youth, the Elevate Youth California, which is for um, substance use uh, disorder prevention, and it's managed by DHCS, um, and uh, the Center at Sierra Health Foundation is the um, you know, main entity that uh, they um, manages it. And it's for nonprofits and tribal orgs that work to prevent substance use among youth. And um, it's important to note that it supports youth leadership and activism and support of policy and environmental change related to substance abuse prevention. And in addition, the program funds direct services in the areas of uh, youth mentoring and youth peer uh, to peer supports. The third program is the Youth Community Access Grant Program, and it's managed by the California Natural Resources Agency. And um, it's for local, state, and federal agencies, um, nonprofits, and tribal organizations. This grant program supports youth access to natural and cultural resources with a focus on low-income and disadvantaged communities as it relates to you know, youth substance use prevention. And so um, the thing to note about this one is that it funds youth in the outdoors, um, education, skill building, uh, cultural healing activities. Um, so environmental um, justice uh, comes into play for uh, the Natural Resources Agency grant program. And then the last one um, is the Public Health and uh, Safety Grant Program managed by BSCC. And um, this one's a little different because it's for local governments that assist with law enforcement, fire protection, or other local programming to address you know, public health and safety uh, as it relates to the implementation of Prop 64. Um, but this one's really important to us because each applicant must propose projects that include youth development, youth prevention and intervention act activities. You know, actually um, at least 10% of requested funds have to be used to support young people in this uh, program. So, you know, we um, basically wanted to be um, a part of that because we didn't want the um, funds to be primarily used for law enforcement and the recriminalization um, of our marginalized communities. Again, you know, these four grant programs have over $70 million in them uh, currently, and we'll continue to work on making sure that they're reinvested in communities of color. Um, we don't wanna see the funds go to law enforcement and uh, the criminalization of our people anymore. So uh, Jim will talk about preventing that um, in our local uh, cannabis tax revenues. Great, thank you, Sarah Michael. Um, so as Sarah just uh, described, we've made some good progress in influencing the allocation of state cannabis revenues. Unfortunately, we're seeing a different pattern with local cannabis revenues. And about a year or so ago, we commissioned a report, uh, brought on some consultants to help do an analysis of what's happening with local government and local cannabis tax revenues. Uh, next slide. What we found um, taking place with cities and counties is that uh, cities and counties are bringing in a substantial amount of new revenue from cannabis. And unfortunately, they have chosen for the most part to spend those new dollars um, on law enforcement and in their general fund. So I think as most folks know, um, law enforcement makes up the biggest part of the general fund of pretty much any city in the state. 
about 40% typically. What we've seen as um, uh, cities and counties have legalized cannabis and collected local tax revenue, we've seen their police budgets grow considerably um, as a result of this new revenue. Uh, next slide. So this is an example from Greenfield, uh, a relatively small community in the Salinas Valley. As you'll see here, Greenfield passed a cannabis tax and uh, the number of police officers in their community has gone from about 16 to about 34. There are folks organizing in Greenfield right now to try to redirect those revenues toward uh, prevention, youth and other good purposes. But um, for the most part, what my experience has been in watching this happen with cities is that it's happened quietly and um, there aren't that many folks aware of it. So Sarah Michael and I have been trying to raise awareness and to support local organizing as groups shift to capture at least part of this revenue for a better purpose. Okay, next slide, please. Part of what we've been seeing uh, both at the state level and at the local level is an alliance between the cannabis industry, law enforcement and government where the cannabis industry is calling for a crackdown on the underground market and calling for more law enforcement. Uh, law enforcement then of course is proposing uh, that in order to do such a crackdown, it requires more resources and more funding. And as the cannabis industry becomes more politically influential, what we're seeing is that government is um, been happy to go in that direction. Both local government, as well as the Newsom administration have both um, invested new, uh, more dollars in law enforcement to support uh, a, cr a crackdown on the underground economy. Okay, next slide. Um, I should mention that um, as we've been looking at local um, cannabis tax revenues, there are some good, there are some positive examples. There are some counties and cities in the state that are using cannabis revenue for youth, for prevention, for community economic development. Um, and one of the reasons why we feel it's so critical that local government be held accountable for uh, cannabis revenues and how those revenues are allocated is because of these growing, uh, co growing concern for public health. So we, we're watching uh, the cannabis industry evolve into sort of a new, a new, a new form of a tobacco industry. Um, cannabis has uh, much higher THC levels today than in the past as the industry has amped up THC levels in cannabis products. It's increased the risk of addiction and psychosis. There is a growing body of evidence that cannabis uh, use, frequent use of particularly high THC products is a trigger for uh, psychosis among young people and uh, is a, has a very negative impact on youth mental health. We're also seeing kind of the same game that the tobacco industry has played for years in developing products meant to attract youth, such as flavored products, products that look like snack foods and candy. And then finally, the cannabis industry does a lot of um, inaccurate uh, or misleading marketing of its products, making health claims that have no scientific evidence. And just as an example of this marketing, um, next slide, please. Uh, this is a billboard that was up here in Sacramento for a few years, um, actually uh, down the street from the neighborhood where Flo and I live on Stockton Boulevard in South Sacramento. So as you can see in this billboard, we have a young woman. She can be anywhere from her late teens to her early 20s um, with the message of feel better, hugs, uh, a young woman, a young woman of color. Um, so this is the kind of stuff for those of us who have worked on tobacco policy and soda and are aware of the kind of insidious marketing that goes on by in the corporate world. This is the kind of stuff that really makes our hair stand on end, at least, at least for me. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, as we're going forward and continuing to organize and build coalitions statewide around cannabis policy, here's kind of the short list of what we're working on. Um, so one goal we have is to maintain current cannabis tax levels. Every year, the cannabis industry has attempted to lower its tax rate 
through legislation at the state capitol. Fortunately, they have been unsuccessful so far. Uh, if they were to be successful in lowering their tax rate, of course, we would see less revenue come in. We would see a cheaper product um, that would be more accessible to, to youth. Um, and so we have uh, pushed back and fought against the bills that have been in the legislature to lower the tax rates. Um, we'll continue to advocate for more revenue to be invested in grassroots organizations embedded in communities of color. As Sarah Michael mentioned, um, the most pro uh, uh, issue we're working on right now is the grant program managed by the Bureau of State and Community Corrections. We're working to steer more of those dollars towards youth and prevention and to redirect those dollars away from law enforcement. Um, at the state and local level, we'll continue to advocate, advocate against cannabis revenue going to law enforcement. We'll continue to oppose the uh, criminalization of the underground market, and uh, which in many ways, uh, what we're seeing with that crackdown on the underground market, it is uh, sort of a war on drugs 2.0. Um, and then finally, uh, we're actively assisting several local communities with that are organizing on local cannabis tax revenue. For example, San Joaquin County currently has a cannabis tax on the ballot where at least 50% of the funding from that new revenue would go towards youth and prevention and none of the funding uh, from the new tax would go uh, to expand law enforcement. Um, so we'll see what happens. It's uh, voters in San Joaquin County will decide on that measure in two weeks. Uh, and if it wins, I think it will set a new precedent of local government um, using local cannabis revenues uh, for a good purpose. And that is everything that we wanted to present to you. I know we've put a lot of information in front of you and I'm gonna turn it over to Christine Tien now, our friend and colleague from the California Endowment who has been a terrific uh, supporter uh, in this space. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I just want to first express my deep appreciation for Flow with Public Health Advocates and Jim and Sarah Michael with Youth Forward and of course Malachi with uh, California Urban Partnership, great organizations. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I have to say that had these um, advocates that we heard from today not been pushing for or watching the establishment of these statewide and local programs, fewer dollars would be going towards community-based organizations and more would be going towards law enforcement. These uh, advocates also helped push for criteria that made sure funds were going to communities most impacted by the war on drugs. So um, I, I'm sure I might be preaching to the choir, but funders should consider the following. Number one, funding small grassroots organizations led by Black, Indigenous, people of color, and or those that are most connected to communities most impacted. Number two, fund organizations that are pushing and monitoring government policies and programs all the way from the state level down to local government to make sure systems, our government systems are creating policy and, and programs that truly benefit the people that need the services the most. Number three, consider funding organizations from policy development all the way through implementation and beyond. Sometimes the implementation process actually might even take longer than the passage of the policy. As in this case, I think funding the, the monitoring of the implementation process resulted in more money for organizations truly serving people that are most impacted. So in closing, we as funders might be interested in funding service providers, which is all good, but to make deep, long lasting sustainable change we have to fund organizations monitoring and pushing systems so more money is actually invested in people that actually need the services the most. So I also wanted to just thank Adrian for coordinating everything and um, definitely deep appreciation for everybody on this panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine, and thank you to all of our panelists and attendees. We have about 15 minutes left and we wanted to open it up to questions and answers, comment, discussion, um, because we have 
you know, a, a more intimate crew um, on the line today. I think what we would like to do is if you all want to raise your hand, um, I can take you off of mute and you can join, your voice can join us. That way we can actually engage in more of a discussion. Um, I know we have one person on the phone. So that's confusing to me about what to do there. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, let's open it up now to any comments. Any questions for clarification, we did give you all a lot of information. And just as a heads up, um, I will be sending out the slides from our presentation. So you'll have some chance to dig into the material a little more. And if you are feeling shy or whatever, feel free to also use our chat or Q&A function on Zoom. Okay, Martin, go ahead. Hi, I, I had some audio problems at the end. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, so yeah, this was... Now you've cut out, Martin. I think we're unable to hear you, so. I'll type, I'll type instead. Okay. Audio issues. Okay, great. So, <laughs> so while Martin's doing that, if anyone else wants to raise a hand. Thank you for that appreciation, Anuja. We can also open it back up to our panelists if there are any pieces that you wanna come back to share in more depth, ask of each other, we can take some time to do that too. When will the documentary, um, I may, may have missed this, but when is it gonna be um, launched, I guess? Yes, so we are on track to release the documentary in mid-January, and I'm really looking forward to it. It will be a four-part series. Uh, it will have uh, uh, one series that's focused on economic development uh, and business uh, development in the uh, cannabis space, another part focused on public health, uh, where we really want to get uh, youth to weigh in on the impacts of the war on drugs, uh, the third on tax revenue, and then the fourth on criminal justice system reform. And how long is the whole four part series? So uh, each part is, a pro we're, you know, we're still uh, toying around with that in, in the editing process, but our goal is is to have uh, each piece no longer than uh, about 10 minutes. So many documentaries, real easy to watch. Yeah. All right, I have Martin's question. I'll go ahead and read it out loud. And thank you, Martin. What is big marijuana's position on equity and are there pressure points communities can use to maybe convert the industry to more equitable outlook and ideal practice. I believe it's supposed to be ideal practice, either through direct engagement with the industry or leveraging community relationships with policymakers. Right. You know, uh, that's a great question, Arden. Um, I think one of the things that we really have as a challenge is to um, follow industry players or, 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 or connect with ind industry players that are not just talking the talk, but also, you know, walking the walk. You know, there are some, you know, who have put out, you know, $50,000 uh, grants uh, to upwards to uh, 10 different uh, social equity operators uh, with, you know, no expectation of a return on investment, 
Uh, they have um, provided training uh, as well as um, uh, you know some some uh, legal uh, uh, assistance um, in that whole process of training and helping folks get their business plan together and get their pitch deck uh, uh, prepared to uh, uh, make a, that uh, presentation to investors. Um, I think we really need to, uh, uh, at the same time though, be very careful about, um, um, you know, uh, the, the campaign contributions that are going to elected officials uh, and um, uh, holding them accountable uh, so that, uh, you know, we can break up that relationship uh, between government, law enforcement, and the cannabis industry that leads to using the police as mercenaries uh, to get rid of the competition. That competition comes from the underground uh, uh, market, and that underground market does not have... Uh, the, um, the access to capital, nor the uh, very expensive technical assistance that is needed to get through a complex regulatory uh, process. And we believe that uh, that regulatory process was made to be complicated and, and expensive uh, on purpose. I hope that answers. Yeah, thank you, Malachi. Does anyone else want to share about the big marijuana industry question. Can maybe you repeat that again, Adrian? Maybe there's some contours of that question that I didn't uh, target or maybe sure. you would benefit from hearing it again. Yeah, and we also have one other question from Aaron Gilbert. So um, Martin's question around big marijuana's position on equity, pressure points communities can use to convert the industry, industry to more equitable outlooks, um, either through direct engagement or leveraging community relationships with policymakers. Okay. I don't know if Thank any of my Jim. other colleagues want to Yeah, add. I can comment on that, um, Adrian. So one thing that's different about cannabis like versus tobacco is that Prop 64 was pretty much silent on how local governments can regulate tobacco. I mean, sorry, can regulate cannabis. So local governments do have the ability to pass uh, regulations, public health protections above and beyond what was in Prop 64. Um, so as we look at um, what's happening with the cannabis industry locally, uh, local government has a fair amount of ability to shape how that, what that looks like. Um, uh, and uh, Lynn Silver at the Public Health Institute and I have been making an effort to get out some of those uh, you know, or model ordinances and ways in which local government can do more regulation of the, of the industry. So. I would just add too that local uh, uh, government uh, engagement uh, with the industry on on, 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 on having a, a broader reach um, um, uh, to other cities and counties that don't have uh, equity programs so that they're, so that cities and counties are learning from their peers as to how to get equity right and figuring out a way to align what they are doing uh, and then further uh, in, um, encourage and promote uh, the state of California for state licenses to align with those uh, local licensing requirements for equity uh, that intentionally places a higher priority on people who've been impacted by the war on drugs. I think I want to build on what Malachi is saying, and maybe this is the you know unpopular opinion, but I think especially as it relates to funders, since you know you all are the the target of, of um, this or the the target audience for this um, particular you know webinar. What I see as a real opportunity is for you all to invest in organizations to be able to help states that are considering legalization to do this work from the outset, because one of the things that's really frustrating is that. We all, I mean, the history that, you know, we, we documented here and the work that, you know, Jim and Sarah Michael, you know, were able to lift up about how the money was spent 
is a grave injustice. It's like the very entity that's responsible for the, the racial disparities and the outcomes and that opposed legalization almost unanimously then is the entity that benefits the most from legalization be, behind people who were not impacted by the war on drugs. And so this is an opportunity like um, we've had several times in the past and that has largely been squandered. I mean, you know, not to undermine the great work that everybody on this you know, call has done, but you know, if we look at, you know, again, going back to Sacramento, right? Like 30 dispensaries, none of them are owned by you know by people of color none of them are black people right like I mean this is this is a missed opportunity with a new industry where we could have said let's get this right from the start by giving you know first dibs at the industry not support you know four or five six seven years later once the industry industry is saturated but first dibs to the people who were in the illegal market now that we have changed the boundary of it um, and instead of doing that we didn't and so I think there really is groundwork that could be done since many other states like New Jersey and others are legal or you know have it on their ballot right now and others are considering mm. doing this in the future to really do some groundwork there so that the legislation when it comes out and the way that people are thinking about how they structure things from the beginning can give people you know can engage in restorative justice by by engaging those communities that were harmed um and so i just don't think that can be stated you know <laughs> clearly enough yeah. that this work needs to happen even before something becomes legal because at that point the industry has lined up and the industry looks like many of our industries unfortunately and it continues to perpetuate the racial wealth gaps um and all of you know the, the ways in which um you know markets are often you know predatory and leave out the same people over and over again and so it'd be it'd be nice for once even in my short lifetime to be able to see us get that right yeah thank you thank you flo I wanted to just raise this question, um, Jim, I think you may have answered directly to Aaron, but just in case it sparks anything or to bring it to everyone, Aaron's question, do you anticipate there will be tax revenue focused in the area of foster adoption for kids who have been removed from homes due to parents affected by the war on drugs? Um, yeah, as I mentioned in the chat, Sarah, Michael and I have been doing uh, outreach specifically to organizations that serve foster youth particularly um, foster youth of color and um, the Elevate Youth uh, grant program administered by DHCS uh, uh, actually refers to foster youth as a population and its most recent RFA. And I'm happy to, um, if folks are interested in learning more about that, I would be happy to be in that discussion. And the first round of grant funding, the California Youth Connection was one of the 20 or so grantees and they were awarded a grant in about, I think about a million dollars from Elevate Youth California. So we were happy to see the inclusion of a organization that uh, empowers uh, young people in the foster care system to be in the mix there, so. Thank you. So we just have a couple minutes and I think following on Dr. Kofer's very clear call to funders to, to get in early, <laughs> um, and start making the impact now, right? Uh, I just wanna open it up to the rest of you all panelists if there's any final words you wanna leave folks with, both who are here and knowing that we'll be sending around this video to many other people. Well, just to build on what Flo has said, I think uh, philanthropy could play a role nationally in creating a conversation around this. I mean, if you consider the fact that like within a few years, we'll probably see about $150 million going out from cannabis revenues to nonprofits working in communities of color. I mean, that's sort of like the creation of a new large foundation in the state. But th that may or may not happen in other states. And, in, and um, we've had to work hard to make that happen. And it should be happening on a larger scale in California. So if philanthropy were to engage and create more of a national conversation around this, it could help lay the groundwork for groups working in other states that are headed towards legalization to get the policy right at the beginning, as well as to help um, states that are early in the implementation, like Illinois. Um, and that conversation is not happening. You know, the whole cannabis legalization world is dominated by the industry and the folks who are pro legalization. There's really, uh, it's not, there's no, container to have that conversation right now or to do that kind of capacity building, awareness building. And I've often thought that's a role that philanthropy could play 
and could steer, you know, millions and millions of dollars across this country to a better purpose and, and uh, protect kids at the same time. I would say that this is a real opportunity to uh, prevent the further traumatization of, of uh, impacted communities. It's also a very real opportunity to make sure that this industry doesn't become another cotton or tobacco or sugar uh, that was built on the pain and suffering of uh, black and indigenous people of color. Sarah, Michael, anything from you? I was just gonna say that um, I think now is the time to be leaders, you know, in philanthropy for social justice and racial justice, especially um, with where we're at, you know, on a large, you know, scale politically, to redirect, you know, these funds for um, those communities, you know, most harmed. It's it's the it's the right thing to do. So to to do that on a on a national scale, as Jim has said, I think would be just you know tremendous um, and not shying away from it. You know, like just really going all in uh, for it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. We're just at time. I appreciate so much all of you, all your clarity. Um, your research commitment and heart to this issue and bringing it to us at CCJFG. And thank you to folks who have joined us. Um, we'll be sending out a follow-up with more material from each of these organizations, a recording of the video and the slide deck. Um, I also included in the chat, the link to our November 20th uh, CCJFG membership meeting, which is run not as a webinar, but as a Zoom meeting where we're in conversation and next month we'll be talking about funding security for activists in the post-election climate. Um, so as members and attendees, please click on that link and join us on November 20th um, and join me in giving your energy. We can't see you, but hope that you all are sending big love and appreciation to all of our panelists. Thank you guys so much. Um, and we will follow up with those of you who joined us today. Take care everyone. Uh, peace.